So don't worry, we will fill the time. Thank you, Robert. Thank you, time, now, I'm going to call Mr. Trevor Warner. While, while Trevor's making his way up, I just want to say this to my fellow committee members too, that I have an email on my desk in Canberra. I was contacted by a Queensland truck driver um, earlier this year. Sit down, sit down, Trevor. Um, uh, to show me where he had entered into his work diary. He had taken an overnight break at Coffs Harbour and he wrote C-O-F-F-S-H-B-R. He abbreviated ha uh, Harbour and copped a $618 fine. So we'll set the scene. That's before we really start ripping into RMS or whatever they're called now, those crooks down there in New South Wales who love busting truck drivers' backsides. Anyway, okay, now the official part. Now, I welcome Mr. Trevor Warner. So, Trevor, can you just let everyone know who you are and what capacity you appear today? Uh, my name's Trevor Warner. I'm a uh, interstate truck driver. Uh, I've been doing this, I've well, been back on the road now for uh, 14, 15 years. Um, previously, I was uh, a local driver that used to load the interstate trucks. We used to pick up the fruit, veggies from the farms, bring them in, load up the trucks, and then the boys would head off, head off to market. And now I'm uh, now I'm back on the highway. Great, and you're also the Queensland rep. Uh, Queensland, um, yeah. My investigations into uh, sorry, I'm just getting who else you represent. Are you representing? No, I'm, no, okay, I'm here just, on my own capacity. Right. Yep, that's fine. Although I am a member of the TWU and also the Queensland delegate for the National Road Freighters Association. Thanks, Trevor. Now I'm going to ask you to make your opening statement before we go to questions. Okay. The floor is yours. Um, how I how I got to this point was um, I was happily doing my job. Uh, then I, I realised that things weren't quite right. Um, I spoke to other drivers, and they uh, they found that um, they weren't earning as much money as me. We went into the investigations of, of why and uh, how it all happened. Um, I contacted. Uh, I followed the government standard rule is to. Uh, contact the Fair Work Ombudsman and following along those procedures, I basically just got bumped from office to office to office and the problem was never resolved. So what I discovered was I went back to these drivers and said, look, this is what you need to do. And they've gone, oh, well, we're not doing that because the last guy that done that ended up um, only earning half the amount of money and he, he basically, what we call, gets starved out. So, so you've got to go and get another job. Um, so there was this bully mentality. And, and it's, it's certainly not entirely the operator's fault. As Rob Bell clearly, clearly said, they're competing in a market. And uh, the, the government's uh, going to say that we've got these mechanisms in place. But these, what I discovered, that these mechanisms actually aren't working. The, the victim of the wage theft then becomes the victim of the system. And if they can't get another job, uh, because word gets around, and I've got examples of that, um, all of a sudden I have got one driver that was off for three months. So because they were chasing uh, unpaid sick leave, they end up taking three months off work, which cost them twenty to $25,000. Mm. So they would have been better off shutting their mouth. Trevor, sorry, before I go, I'm sorry, mate, I should have said this. Are you happy to be filmed or not? Because I'll oh, make sure the camera's Yeah, that, that's fine. I've said this in the public oh. forum. Okay, so if you want to film, Collar, if you want to film, you can, mate. Uh, okay, sorry, Trevor, I should have said that. Just sort of caught the camera in my eye. Yeah. Carry on, please. You're all right. So, so we quickly, uh, I, I contacted the, the union because the, the late, I rung the um, uh, Brendan O'Connor. I spoke to his office and they said, what did the union got to say? And uh, so I ended up joining the union just so I could get my foot in the door and, and be heard. Um, I quickly realised that even though they're extremely helpful, uh, they're facing the same challenges as what the individual is as well, dealing with the bureaucracy. Um, I spoke to uh, uh, Senator Cash, because th th it appeared to be a legislative issue, and she said, well, um, the Ombudsman, the Fair Work Ombudsman, that's their, that's their department, they're an independent agency, and uh, you need to talk to them. I, I can't help. And I'm, I thought, well, this, this is strange. So once again, we're back on this merry-go-round and every week that goes past, I've got example after example, which I've, I've sent to you, um, of drivers being <clears throat> taking home $200 a week less than I was and I was getting just the, just the bare minimum. 
So they're losing 10 grand a year. Uh, I've got, I had one driver that was losing 10 grand a year and then he turned around and got a $7,000 tax bill because of a pay, even though he was being paid the correct component within the pay slip, the way the mathematics worked out, uh, he was actually underfunding his tax liability. So at the end of the year, he's lost $10,000 in wages from the minimum award and then he's got a $7,000 tax bill on top of it. Uh, I only spoke to this guy last week, he's got a tax bill again and the guy's... Same guy, different guy? Same guy. Yeah, okay. um, and, and he's just beside himself. Yeah. And he, he can't... He, or he just wants to swear and punch people, honestly. Yeah. Um, that's the point that, we, that we've, we've come to. So um, I set up a bit of a Facebook group called uh, The Driver's Advocate and I'm putting up information to try and help people and streamline the, uh, the process. Yeah. Um, Facebook's certainly not a place to find solutions but it's a good place to share information and, and so these, these drivers don't feel isolated and alone and um, it's pretty hard going home explaining to your wife that uh, you're not getting paid right or I've opened my mouth and all of a sudden I'm now only earning 50% of what it was last week. Uh, it's, it's pretty, it's pretty gut-wrenching to, to stand in front of a boss, particularly if you're not, if you haven't got any options. Um, I've sort of been fairly uh, up front and gone, well, hey, look, I'm happy with the way I'm being paid, but I've noticed this, and you need to rectify it because it's, it's creating a liability. And approaching it that way, the bosses have been quite receptive. I've had a, a gentleman uh, in New South Wales did, did that, and uh, him, uh, the payroll basically said, I'm right, you're wrong, go away. And, and he was losing $200 a week uh, from his minimum wage as Rob said the minimum wage isn't real good considering that we're working two and three full-time jobs. Trevor, can I just touch on that because I've stolen your line um, when you and I, I listened into one of your podcasts, mm -hmm. um, but you really you really uh, uh, turned a light on in my head because we, we know exactly what's going on. Getting it across is the heart. How do we simplify it and get people to say, hang on, you're right, it's not a us versus them thing. But you had said you used the wording that Someone had said, you earn $100,000 a year, geez, that's great. Mm -hmm. And your comeback was, well, hang on, I'm doing two full-time jobs, two yep. normal full-time jobs, mm -hmm. which absolutely, and Rob touched on it too, you're not working 38 hours a year. And the majority of our line haul truck drivers, and I, I don't want to cut out the, the Metro guys, but mm -hmm. the line haul, this is our life. This is, you know, 80, 90, 100, whatever, whatever the law allows us to do. And, yeah. and long as the folks here. So, so tell us a bit more about that, mate, because see, some people might sit back those are the uninitiated that might be sitting there saying, well, why, why do you do it? Why don't you go get another job? Well, where I live on the Sunshine Coast, um, in, incomes are low uh, at the lower spectrum. Um, expenses, living costs are high. I had, a, I had a guy say to me once that, that you're a workaholic. Why don't you just go and do uh, work half the amount of time? Because then it makes the road safer. And I've gone, well, OK, so if I just work a 38 hour week, that covers my car payment and doesn't quite cover my mortgage. So therefore, I've got to get another job. The opportunities in my region um, isn't that great. Uh, I've got gentleman, uh, a gentleman in northern Queensland. Um, he's, he's earning good money. He's being underpaid. But to move to Brisbane, um, he's actually worse off because the cost of living is a lot higher. He's better off losing, being paid less than the minimum and living in a regional area. Trevor, is this a, a um, geographical problem? And what I mean by that is it is it certain areas of Australia where um, all the drivers around that region are getting paid around the same rate, which is not as high as other regions. And I know that sounds it sounds a little bit wishy washy. I, I believe so it's, it's, a, to, it's a sector oh, yeah. issue. Sector, Some okay. sectors, like if you're doing chemical tankers in North Queensland, that's a specialised area, so you can command a decent price. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but as Rob mentioned in um, in regional areas where there's a lot of uh, freight moving to those areas, regional Queensland, um, freight going to those areas, you can't make money running your truck back empty. So there's... Um, there's a, well, there's isn't a, that an oxymoron? No, 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 I've got to come down there, Trevor, OK? You can't make money running back empty. So why doesn't the forward trip pay for the return trip? Well, that, that's that's a good point. It's probably unfair of me to put that to you as an employed driver, but you did raise it. 
Yeah, no, it's a, it's a two-way thing and um, you, you'll have um, trucks that are based in central Queensland or, or a regional area bringing uh, agricultural products into the cities. Well, they need loads from the cities to go back to their areas, so you get payment both ways. So it's got to a point now where um, load allocators, um, people in charge of moving the freight, they, they know that you live in central Queensland or a regional area and you need to get home. So they, they wind the price down. Okay. So let's come back to the, the, what you're saying, because you're the, uh, the, call yourself the driver advocate and you're doing your best to help your workmates, which is, which is very honourable. What's the fix? What is the solution that we should be looking at as an industry to say, now, hang on, what it, leave aside the award rate, but that is the instrument that's supposed to be, you know, the, the, the Bible and the land mm-hmm. of but it's not happening, it's not being enforced. What's the fix, Trevor? Well, one of the, one of the biggest complaints that we've had, and there's an application uh, in the Fair Work Commission at the moment, that a company like Toll or Linfox or IPEC or any of the overnight express companies, they've got, a, uh, they've got basically two businesses. They've got a local pickup and delivery service, and then they've got the inter- interstate. So there's two clear-cut uh, divisions. In smaller companies that don't have that volume of freight, they've been able to work out that um, because of the way the award works, we can send the long distance driver to go and do that pickup and come back to the depot, pick up a bit of extra freight, do his paperwork and shoot through to the next city over, overnight. Now, they don't have the infrastructure or they don't have the turnover to be able to have depots all over the place. So you've got uh, companies that e- even 30, 40 trucks uh, they will get, they will work out that we can do we can do so many pickups, but we'll we'll allocate the long distance drivers to go and do that pickup and go and we don't have to pay them for that pickup because that's the way the award works. Now that's a solution. Yeah, so, sorry, to the way the award works is you don't have to get paid to do your pickups. Tell me a bit more about that. Okay, um, I was really hoping Nat Road was going to be here this afternoon because they. They have, they've made their position public, so I guess I can talk about it. Um, the industry has geared itself towards what the big companies want, which is cheap labour. So in the, in the long distance award in particular, there's a definition under the long distance operation, which means you can pick up freight in one, one state and deliver that same freight to a different state and the driver only needs to be paid for the kilometres travelled, GPO to GPO. So in the case of Melbourne and Sydney, uh, I think it's 910 kilometres. Um, and then, then they say that if you want to pay your driver on an hourly rate, um, that takes the driver 10 hours. So whatever the, the dollar figure is, multiply by the 10 hours. What they, what they don't allow for and what they're arguing black and blue to prevent is that that driver may, may have spent 17 hours to do that to do that work because you've got time at the pickup point and then you're being asked to deliver. So if we can get around to fixing that. So that's uh, the kilometre rate? The kilometre rate, right. yeah. 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 Now I don't have a problem with the- Versus hourly, sorry. That's Correct. Okay. I don't have a problem with kilometre rate because the example that I've given to the Fair Work Commission is it's, there's only a few dollars difference if, if the drivers are doing the same work. But the, the award, the way it stands now with the definition of loading and unloading and the long distance operation means that the driver can spend um, six hours in Sydney loading, do his 10 hours, uh, have, a, have a sleep when he gets to the other end and then go and do that delivery. So uh, I put to uh, Professor Dawson that... Drew Dawson? Drew That's Dawson. Good. That because of the, and, and I was critical of the fatigue laws and they needed amending, that to do my job was a 26 hour day, 26 hour shift to make, to do it legally, but I only got paid for the 10 hours or the 11 hours if you're coming to Brisbane in that 26, the rest of the time was for the good and the love of the company. Oh. That was going to, going to be my question because if you actually have to have a rest, because you can only drive for a certain amount of hours, mm-hmm. so that's your that's your problem. 
that you, well, you it's not covered in your hourly rate. So do right. you have a choice of whether you have an hourly rate or whether you have a kilometre rate? Who who determines that? Typically, it's the um, it's the company, the employer. So that, you work for someone. You're not an owner driver. No, I'm an employee driver. Yeah. Um, and the, the things that I'm talking about here is my, my employer tries to do everything po as legal as possible. We've got satellite tracking, all the, all the works and jerks, but he's now competing against the, uh, the, the drivers that, and the owner drivers that Rob Bell was talking about. Mm -hmm. So that there's pressure on him to, he wants to pay us correctly, but he can't because he, he won't be able to tender for the job at, at a successful price. Do you know, follow that? Yes, yes, I do. Yeah. So typically it's a kilometre rate. Um, and if we're just driving from point A to point B, like, uh, say, Toll IPEC, that's fine. We get paid quite OK. But we're now being asked to do pickups and deliveries either end mm -hmm. and then try and get in our and do that in the minimum legal time so we can get reloaded and head back to the next city on our, on, for the second day. Otherwise, you, you might sit in uh, Sydney all day and I oh, can't get a load. So you've got an employee sitting in Sydney that is going nowhere and you don't have to pay them. I want to expand on that if I can, please, Trevor, because um, at the hearing down in Albury, I think it was Chris Rowe mm -hmm. uh, that actually um, uh, explained it like, you know, that's fine if you're going from GPO to GPO. Yeah. But then if you start, and forgive me because I'm not a local in Victoria or New South Wales, uh, but if you're doing a pickup the other end of Melbourne and a delivery the other end of Sydney, mm -hmm. and all of a sudden there's two, three hours of extra which you're not getting paid. Not only that, probably the, the company's not getting paid either. Correct. There's probably a very good chance of that too. Yeah. But one of the other witnesses, I can't remember who it was down in Albury, said that he absolutely lies. Mm -hmm. came straight out. He said, I break the law because if I put down my pickups and deliveries, mm -hmm. I lose hours at the end of the day for my logbook. Yeah, well, I that's mean, right. my jaw, I mean, I know yeah. it happens, but my jaw hit the deck to think that if there was any official listening to that, yeah, that poor bugger would be reamed through. They'd be on him like a ton of bricks, but everyone just lets it float past. We won't, we'll just tuck our head. We won't worry yeah. about that. I've been doing that for 15 years, Senna. Mm -hmm. And and you are not the only one, Trevor. I'm not you know, the only one. And yeah. and what I explained to Dr. Drew Dawson was the 26-hour day for me came about by fitting the, the, the freight task into the legal requirement. So yeah. instead of me getting loaded out of Sydney and then heading off to Brisbane and being in Brisbane by say 2 p.m. so I could go to 2 a.m. sorry to go to sleep I'm now wasting hours in Sydney mm. and then driving in the the most critical part of the night just to do it legally now if I don't do that I, I don't have uh, I can't get reloaded within my legal time frame so <laughs> you got you got to fidget the book but I, I'm trying to I've spoken to Professor Williamson and uh, yes. Dr D Dawson again um, to say that most most people only sleep 17 hours, seven hours a day, typically. So in the other 17 hours, we're all awake. Who cares if you're sitting here talking to a committee, sitting down the truck stop, and, and quite frankly, my Volvo is just like sitting in front of the telly anyway. Um, what's the difference? You're, you're awake. So we shouldn't have to lie like that. But the, the problem is, is that there's people out there that will lie. And they don't care. They just want to get the job done. And they've got ex-truck drivers or, or somebody who's completely new to the game, who's not qualified, has has not the, the required training, sitting there as an allocator. And they've got customers on the phone going, where's our freight? We've got to pick this up. We're closing at five o'clock. Where's your truck? So he's caught in the middle and, and he's trying to balance his job as well. We get, I got out of Melbourne two hours late the other night, which meant that instead of pulling up at 2 a.m., I was pulling up at um, 4 a.m. and 5 a.m. So we've got to balance all this out. The truck driver, we're the ones that keep everyone out of jail. Because if we make a mistake and run off the road and God forbid a car being in front of us, and I've had many occasions where it's been a close call, it's up to us to make sure the job gets done safely. If we don't do it safely, we go to jail and other people go to jail. But they don't think about that. They just think, oh, the boss has, the boss has given me um, grief about this. You remember that Comet ad 20 years ago? 
Um, yep, this yep. parcel, uh, this parcel isn't isn't in Sydney overnight. It's your job. Oh, yeah. I don't think I saw it in the West, but sorry, kick you. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, there you go. Yeah. 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 Uh, th that was a national TV campaign. Noth nothing's changed. Because mm. if I don't get from Sydney to Woolworths on time, they'll go, I'll go over and park over there for four hours. Well, let's go down that path, Trevor, while we can, because I've been very vocal about the, you know, the, the squeeze from the top of the supply chain mm -hmm. down. There's mm -hmm. no doubt about that. How do we fix that? Well, once again, it comes back to um, the loading and unloading. We, we need to we need to stop the exploitation of truck drivers by having um, a set of rules in place, which is just a, a mild tweak to the, the award. Um, to to it doesn't matter whether you're a local driver or an interstate driver. If for every hour of work that you do, you get paid. So what that does, um, it stops the bottom feeders, as Rob Bell referred them, coming in undercutting so we need a we need a system of i believe um the national heavy vehicle regulator is in the prime position to be able to do this because they're now getting offices in all these different states they need to work in conjunction with the fair work ombudsman uh, and come up with a um, a set of what i call total compliance awareness that if you're going to go and buy a truck and you're going to get a truck license like a, um, you're going you're gonna to tender for, for freight contracts, you need to be go through a, um, a vetting process where you, um, you understand the, the weights, compliance, fatigue compliance, uh, you're a competent, um, uh, you, you can tender for work successfully, uh, you know the wages, and what was the other one? Vehicle maintenance. So they're, they're, they're the five things. Can I, can I come on? Let's, let's, let's throw this out for your thought. Because I'm one of those blokes been around a long time too, as yourself. But, you know, um, most of the employers want to do the right thing. We, we do have a rat bag element out there. We do. And trust me, some of them own a lot of trucks. Yeah. And they come across as absolutely wonderful people. They yeah. should be in jail, some of these people, because I've got it all on my desk. Yes. I know who they are and what they're doing. And they will get mentioned in the Senate, don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. But coming back to the majority of, of transport owners and operators, they want to do the right thing. Surely there has to be some pressure brought about by the top of the supply chain, the clients. Because we know how it works, Trevor. Yeah. When a man or a woman uh, is squeezed, and we know the most insulting words that a transport operator, large or small, can have mm -hmm. is sharpen your pencil. Yeah. You know, and Absolutely. what's your best price? Three times what you're paying, your miserable bastard, but I'm not going to get that. I know that used to be my answer. Yeah. So what do you reckon about that? Rather than it, it appears that we can't put the onus all on the employer, mm. well, what's your thought about further up the chain? Well, I, I spoke to um, Peter Bagini, Queensland TWU. Um, I think we'll be speaking later on today. And he, he mentioned something to me, and, and I, I thought, well, that would be a good idea if we... Ha and. Senator, sorry, Professor Sarah, Sarah Jones, she works for Toll. She mentioned a similar thing in, a, in one of her talks that any Joe Blow can come along and buy a truck, tender for freight and, and go to work. They, they know nothing about the transport industry. Mm. So if one of these operators were to, were to turn up at, say, Woolworths, and he can't prove that he's totally compliant um, with all aspects, well then, Coles and Woolies fall into the line of re the chain of responsibility, but the chain of responsibility under the National Heavy Vehicle Law t to date doesn't go far enough. Mm -hmm. so they're, they're focused on yeah, freight no, no. movements and mm -hmm. and and the vehicle. It doesn't go into tax law, superannuation law, wages, and just those three alone can give a uh, a company um, a commercial advantage when in tendering for work. Um, I've seen, and I've got examples here of, of pay slips where the ATO clearly says that you must pay, this is just an arbitrary figure, you must pay $110 a week in superannuation. The pay slip says 84. It's a 33% underfunding of the driver's super. So you add that up over a period of time. Um, the uh, wages, uh, the 46 cents a kilometre is what we get paid as a B-double at the moment, 46.1. And then travel allowance is to be on top of that. Well, a lot of companies pay, say, 47 cents. They give the driver an extra 50 bucks a week, but then take $300 worth of entitlements off them. 
and, and allowances. So if you argue about that, then you, you're in fear of losing your job. Correct. Is that what it is? Correct. So I don't think there's um, any other industry that I that I know of that if you complain about it, up to, uh, you will lose your jobs. You know, you have people that pay cash under the counter in different businesses and that type of thing. But yep. to the extent of what you're saying here is that, is there other people lining up to take your job like that? Um, that you are in fear two, of actually speaking out about because you're not getting paid the right amount of money. There's at least a billion people off Australia's shores waiting to take our jobs. Yeah. yeah. Essentially. And I've been in operations, I've employed drivers, and I don't okay. care what nationality they are. I've had some Australian guys that are absolutely useless. Well, so well, that's where we've heard where you have in the tunnel in, in New South Wales. They go through the tunnel and they crash the bloody truck and the mm -hmm. tunnel full found to be international drivers. Mm -hmm. So where's, <clears throat> where's the follow-up with that? Where is their ability to be able to drive on our roads to have the, to, because they come in Australia with an international licence, mm -hmm. or they get it here, so they're entitled to drive the trucks. Is, is that right? I'm happy to say it was this committee that uncovered the... Um, abuse of Australia's visa system, the corrupt trainer down there, at, somewhere down the border there, I can't remember which country town. Yeah. So we are very well aware of that, Senator, yeah. yeah. So I was oh, I have had, um, I'm still waiting for answers from the Minister, mm. and this is three years now, so. So it but hasn't been cleaned up? It's around. Well, it's, it's like in regional Queensland, I've got truck companies who can't fill jobs. Mm -hmm. They've been in Brisbane. They cannot get one person to apply for a job at the moment yep. because everybody's sitting at home. Hey, I just wanted to ask you, um, uh, I just feel a bit like Groundhog Day because we sat for a whole day yesterday doing the dairy industry. And for mm -hmm. me, it always comes back to the supermarkets, mm -hmm. screwing down everybody in the, in the supply chain. And the mining companies. And, and then we end up with... You know, the people who are least able to uh, share the risk with somebody else, mm -hmm. you know, they end up paying for it. And, you know, you talked about, uh, you know, their responsibility to pay uh, correct super and correct wages and, and so forth. But, you know, this is exactly the same as the dairy industry. This is exactly the same as every other agricultural supply. And the supermarkets have these ethical supply contracts in place where they talk about paying the cost of production plus a little bit for the man, mm -hmm. you know? So mm -hmm. I, I don't know why we, we're going to keep talking about this problem at every angle and yep. until we regulate supermarkets and give a big stick penalties mm -hmm. um, and enforce them paying a fair price, then we'll, we'll go around, we'll fix dairy and we might hopefully fix trucks, but we'll still have a whole lot of other industries out there that are still being done over. That's right, it seems to be the business model. <laughs> Well, um, it's shareholder value. I, I've, um, I've followed Wall Street for a long time and I was involved in that um, 15 years ago to a certain extent. Um, shareholder value, that's, that's where it is. And as a corporate CEO, that's your job. Your job is to make sure that the shareholders get their, their fair share. But to break that down to mums and dads at home, how many times have we walked into Coles and Woolies and seen bananas for $2.50 or $2.90 one week? and then two days later, they're $1.99. They can fluctuate their prices hugely. Um, truck drivers only want one cent per kilo. To pay us correctly from, say, North Queensland to Perth, um, Sunshine Coast to, to Melbourne, one cent per kilo, is that all, all what we need? And if the transport company gets 10 cents a kilo, which one cent for us, nine cents for them, that would make a world of difference. Now, oh, 10 it's cents. It's familiar, isn't it? Is that regulated? Is that price per kilometre? Is that regulated? Is it? Is um, it in the industry? Who's, no, no the it's, not, it's not regulated. Then why are you saying if they paid us one cent more? Is that the company that you work for? The client. Well, the client. Oh. The client was, as, as Trevor's saying, and it's Chris Rowe said about his example with onions between yeah. Mar Melbourne and Sydney, he was asking for one cent per kilo to make the extra $200 for the trip mm. that would make him sustainable to be able to stay on the road. So if you break it up, so what, Trevor, I think you will speak for yourself. Mm -hmm. If Coles were to put up a banana by one cent, and yep. there is no one cent, so there's a hand of bananas, there's five cents, our truckies would be paid a far more sustainable, safer rate. Our transport industry, that's yeah. where you're heading, Trevor? Absolutely, that's right. Now, how, how I would enforce that, and, I'm, and I, I have my reservations about technology, because technology is an algorithm, and unfortunately humans are not out, not not computers, but 
I think the best solution is is if we had a national licensing system um, with a national heavy vehicle regulator could could um, could access that. Um, so if you want to start up a transport company, you've got to you've got to have this particular license, which is basically what we've got now, but it's in different modules. So that means that you're paying you're, you're totally compliant with the um, national heavy vehicle law you're compliant with the um, the modern awards the tax and the and the super so when you go to tender for work coles and woolies can go are you accredited company yes we are well so coles and woolies know that if they're going to offer you fifteen hundred dollars to do a job that's actually going to cost you sixteen hundred dollars to execute well then they, they're automatically guilty of um, offering a price that's substandard, that they know that somebody's doing something illegal to provide that service. Mm. And if that's the cut, why don't we all just go and sell drugs? Mm. You know, I'll just take a pallet of tomatoes off and put a pallet of drugs on and make the money that way. Like, it's only another law. We're breaking the tax laws, we're breaking the super laws. Um, we're causing somebody else to go bankrupt because we've just undercut them. Why don't we just all transport drugs instead? And so Growcom has just done an arrangement exactly like that with the supermarkets, a certification program that says that they're not breaching anti-slavery laws, they're mm -hmm. doing all, you know, all the sustainability and whatnot. And, uh, and I think that is a great way to do it, is that we hold supermarkets up to the standards now, that consumers expect. I think that bit about shareholder value, Share, um, customers and shareholders have changed. They want businesses to, to be more responsible and more yeah. sustainable. So I think that's the and right And that has time. a flow-on effect too. Like, we're noticing all the good truck stops now are closing. They're, they're really struggling, pre-COVID, of mm. course. But um, if you pull up for a meal, I got a guy the other day in Mackay, $35 for, for T-bone and salad, and you know, he nearly fell off his chair. Mm. Well, they obviously need that to be compliant in their industry, but because we're being done out of... Uh, when we're not getting our, our minimum award, well then we can't spend that money at that truck stop. So it, it's got a domino effect. Um, I know drivers, uh, sorry, owner drivers that are buying stuff on eBay because they, they're bringing it in from overseas. Stuff. What, 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 stuff. Oh, there was uh, two particular things that we, we were talking about. Or... Yeah, brake boosters. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, now, what's the quality of that brake booster? Our local auto electrician had to go to a court case because the, the truck that he worked on um, had brake boosters from overseas and they weren't up to standard. The guy pulled the brakes on and the truck rolled away. Um, so... I just that, want to... Yeah. I just want to cover another area is the regulations that are in place. And what I've heard is that if a truck he breaks down on the side of the road and he's actually... Um, problems with the tyre, you can't actually change that tyre by yourself. You've, you're supposed to have couple people there or you've got to call out someone well, or, or you can depends what company you work for yeah that, that's a, a, in place and, and why what does it mean what company is it is it a company regulation or Some is it, yes. or is it yes. yeah. Yeah. Th this is this is Some how companies. silly oh and s has become where if you're not a qualified tire fitter you can't change that tire but um when i was in charge of the workshop at an old company um i had one mechanic that every time the truck had tyre work done, it was his job to use a torque wrench to make sure that those nuts were tensioned up to the manufacturer's specifications. On the side of the road, you can't do that. Yep. A tyre fitter has that as standard equipment. But to have those policies and procedures in place and then somebody to audit that, and up, that's, that's another person in the, in, the, in the office that you've got to pay for out of the measly freight rate. So yeah. everything's getting squeezed by this expanding amount of regulation. So where's the money going to come from to pay for compliance? So we're, we're offsetting the cost of compliance with actual true safety. I'm going to throw something else at, at you. The general public that drive on the road have no understanding of being a truckie. Mm -hmm. That the distance that you've got to have from the car in front of you, how you drive on the roads, and that usually these cars come up, speed up, and get in front of you, and then you've got to back off again because you know that what's your, your distance for safety. Yeah. Do you believe that it should be in the interest of the public that when they get their driver's license, they have, must have a clear understanding of um, sharing the road with truck drivers?
I mean, truck drivers have to understand it, don't you? But do the public really understand what it's like to drive on the road with a truck driver, especially with truckies, especially B doubles, when mm. they with the loads that they have on, they can't pull up all of a sudden. And a bit of better awareness for the public. Um, the, the cars that, well, first of all, there's only a handful of truck drivers left in Australia that, that actually understand that. Um, what, truck drivers? Yeah. Understand? Yeah. I took a I I, uh, I took dash cam footage going to Adelaide once, and there was two trucks travelling about six metres apart, two B doubles, and they would have weighed anywhere between fifty and sixty eight ton, six metres apart. Uh, it's a pet hate of mine, but we've got a lot of truck drivers now that, through training, through arrogance, through anxiety caused by all this compliance and all this pressure, um, I, I used to race speedway cars, so. You, you, you get you get to know you get to know how your vehicle. Yeah, but I'm not talking about training truck drivers. I'm talking about when, when the, the general, the public, yeah. educating the public to understand. I I, I think trucks. if you ask most car drivers, they're good drivers. They think they're good drivers. That's, um, that's the word. Think. Yeah, they yeah. think they're a good driver, but in actual fact, they they've got no idea. There's plenty of dash cam footage around with cars pulling in front of trucks because yeah. they're just going to the shops they, and they're, they're doing their thing. <coughs> yeah, mm. and we're the ones that have got to be aware in our mirrors and what's yeah. in front of us to see what's going on, to see what this person is going to do. Uh, we've seen some insane things that I've seen probably less riskier things on a racetrack. Mm. And this is a public street. So I don't think media campaigns might be, might be interesting, but I think it's a waste of money. Because the people that really need to know that information... Yeah, but I'm um, talking about when you go to get your licence, the young ones. Yeah. When they get their licence, there's too many deaths on our roads, yeah. even truckies deaths and all the rest of it. It's mm -hmm. because of incompetent driving mm -hmm. and you don't understand that when you've got a huge truck behind you, the weight they're carrying, you just don't come in and, and because you want to get in front of the truck and then yeah. you come to a... Uh, because you pulled up because the car in front of you and then all of a sudden you've got a truck right up your mm -hmm. backside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's what I'm saying, is that... You know, everyone, because I talk to people and people say to me, and I've got a friend in Sydney who says, don't want the trucks on the road, get the trucks off the road because they cause all these accidents. Mm -hmm. I said, well, if you don't have trucks on the road, you won't have your goods in the, in the shops for you to buy. Yeah. And it's the attitude, as I say, it's about time people should understand mm -hmm. and work, you know, with the trucks and understand truck drivers and the jobs that they have to do. Um, that's our, that's our my essential point. service providers. Well, of course. Sure. It's important See, for the country that we live in. Technically, cars are supposed to travel at 60 metres as well. That's that's classified as a safe distance, which is two, roughly two seconds. Yeah. So at 100 k's an hour, it's 27.7 roughly metres metres a second. So we're all the rules are there, um, and the the incidents that I that I see, they're actually they're actually bre breaching the most basic uh, road rules anyway. Yeah. With the way they drive, failing to give way. Uh, they're not following their, their own uh, safe travel distance within the, the, the light vehicle environment. So overall, your opinion is, all right, just want to quickly answer. Should be a national um, road structure mm -hmm. for compliance with, with road transport. Mm -hmm. When you talk about what you should get paid, then again, and I'm just talking, thinking on top of my head, all right? Yeah, that's fine. If you had uh, everyone um, compliance with, if you're going to do a job over a distance, say, say if you, you had a truck driver going from Sydney to Melbourne, taking goods for, for a client, mm -hmm. that's set on not only a, um, it's a set price, basically a set price that you have to have. So if you, whoever's doing it, say, so it has to be compliant with all industry, right across the trucking industry, there has to be a minimum price for that job to be done so if you have if you have a price structure on not only distance but also the size of it tonnage um yeah, is that possible yeah, yeah um, when i was doing uh quarry work it was on a tonnage basis tonnage and distance so if you if there's a set price structure put mm -hmm. in place regulated so that if you're going to do that job, you can't quote under that price. 
Um, that's that sounds good in in theory, and and I'm just trying to think of, of yeah, some way yeah. of dealing with it because no one's come up with anything else to tell me how it's got it. I, I actually supported the RSRT um, in its in its concept. I didn't agree. I, I, I said to Rob Bell before, I think if they had taken the word individual out and placed person in there, which which meant it covered everybody. But that RSRT, um, at the time I wasn't a member of parliament, when I mm. heard of it and I was told it by the by the truckies when I was on the Burren Butter K run, yeah. and the fact is it was going to um, hurt more the individual owners, the drivers, the, rather than the big companies. The individual, that's right. That's right. Yeah. And that's why I, I thought, no. Yeah. I wasn't well, happy with that. And I agree. The, what we had hoped the RSRT was going to do was, was put the, the big guys, the Coles and the Woolies, onto the focusing on that truck that's backed onto that dock. That the guy that owns that truck was going to get a, a, minimum, a minimum price so he can be compliant, he could do everything legally. That's what we were hoping. Um, but the way that it got executed was, it turned out it wasn't wasn't that good but that's what we had hoped it was going to shine a light onto the little individual compliance issues so that Coles and Woolies knew that that truck on the dock wasn't using slave labor was safe yeah no but you always it was also restricting someone if they did a job they took it took a load up and they came back empty they couldn't pick up a tractor or a trailer or something you know something else and put it on the truck on the way back without um, charging an enormous amount of money for it oh that's that right was my understanding that's, so, that's right it depends on it depends on the way that that contract's worded. If your contract to go and most owner drivers and uh, the the oversized industry, they they typically go one way and then and then come back or they try and pick up a load. Um, there's so many moving parts, but the common thread amongst all that is that drivers, uh, sorry, uh, operators have to find somewhere to save save money because the client won't pay the money. Now I know examples where the client is paying the money but the owner operator or the, the small fleet owner or the large fleet owner has got a thing for fast cars and drag cars and, and, and boats. So there's no guarantee for the for that rate of the money to get to the guy that actually drives the truck or his his boss that's got two or three trucks. So if there was a national licensing system where you signed up to and you got audited that you're you're doing everything right, paying your tax, paying your super, paying your wages, maintaining your truck, uh, fatigue management, weight management, and uh, and OH and S. Well, then you've been given the thumbs up, so the rate would reflect that. If you quote a price and you can't comply with all those rules, well, you just shot yourself in the foot. You're going to go. You're going to go bankrupt. Well, Thanks, Sydney. Can I just ask then, yes. um, where's your union? If you're paying your union fees, why aren't they going in and asking about your your pay rates then? In, uh, sorry, Senator Stirl. <laughs> I just wanted to ask. What are you, what are you being sorry for? I've been doing this for 40 years. I have nothing to apologise for. And, and, and the argument, <laughs> and the same That's argument right. has been going for 40 years. Okay. Um, I'll use information from the public record. In uh, in January of this year, TWU in Western Australia took Lynn Fox to, to court over an EBA negotiation. Lynn Fox and their highly paid lawyers on multiple hundreds of dollars an hour um, went to court and used the, the existing award or the existing regulations to, to win that case where the drivers were doing you know, two, three, four, five hours, whatever the job took for free. So every time the union, and this is all on the public record, every time the union steps up to take a swing, they get knocked down by these high-priced lawyers. It's these same high-priced lawyers that stand in front of the Fair Work Commission and, and plead the case that um, we've been doing this for so long, we've been negotiating industrial relations for 30 years, we know what we're talking about. This is a personal comment. I go into the Fair Work Commission and I get called a whinge and truck driver that's uh, been dealt a bad deal and I want the world to change to fix my problem. Trouble is, my problem is, is what we're talking about here today. Mm. So these high priced lawyers continue the wheel of the money going to the top end of town.
I think if I can, because of the timing, but I just yeah. I never let an opportunity go by. A, these high-priced lawyers on thousands and thousands of dollars an hour are only operating within the laws that the Howard regime put through and have been strengthened oh, by the, the Abbott the non, strike the Turnbull non, Morrison. The there you go. Things. So on that, can I, I'm so, can sorry, I just tribute. ask one more question? Yeah, I'm sorry. My, my specific actually, issue around? is for um, regional truck drivers yeah. who tell me that they get to, you know, quarter of an hour, half an hour from home, mm -hmm. but they run out of hours and they've got to stop you know, yep. instead of being able to get home. Yep. Is that uh, under the Queensland fatigue management laws or the, what is driving that? Um, well, C Queensland has, uh, has drafted those laws, but th that same law applies in Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, ACT and Tasmania. Yep. We normally throw the logbook under the bunk and just keep on driving home. So, because our problem is, is that if you've loaded, you know, six decks of, of cattle and you've then stopped and had a cup of tea and mm -hmm. you know you run out of hours yeah. and uh yeah or you end up having to leave cattle by the side of the road which is obviously that's right no good either now in in that case you the driver may need to stop for 24 hours but may only need to stop for 12 hours or if he's on a fatigue management regime he might only have to stop for 10 hours my argument is that if if a driver's regular sleep pattern is only five or six hours um He'll, he will have that time and then he'll sit there twiddling his, twiddling his mm. thumbs. I had drivers that used to go to Melbourne, they'd deliver to the Melbourne market and then they'd go to, go to the pub down the road yeah. or they'd get takeaway on the way in. We had a few, um, um, what could I say, brothels down the road and these guys would not sleep. They would go and entertain themselves, drink with their mates, have a what we call a gutter party and have a chin wag. And uh, I'd be ringing them in seven hours saying, I need you to pick up this freight. Yeah. They haven't slept. Yeah. And there's no law to stop that. Yes. And there's also, sorry, have I got two more minutes? Uh, you, you've got two more minutes, Trevor, and I'm going to have to pull up stumps. The fatigue regulations, the way they are, doesn't stop a driver sitting at home for eight or 10 hours in the morning and driving a truck at night time. Mm. Uh, I was sitting in Melbourne one day uh, having breakfast and two guys come in. One guy drove a taxi, one guy drove a container truck. It was 6 a.m., half-time swap jobs. They were doing, who knows, 18, 20 hours a day. You're not suggesting that fatigue management doesn't manage fatigue, are you, Trevor? That it only manages hours. Well, Sorry. Once again, it fits into the algorithm. So the way, the way we are now, there is... There is no way to police a driver doing working a part-time job in the morning and then drive, then doing a 14-hour shift in a truck. Yeah. Yeah. So if that's if that can be done legally, mm. who cares if the driver is an hour from home and just continues home? Yeah. That's right. We but have these Australian views. So. Yeah. Can I just say, look, it has gone over that we we did schedule a 15-minute stretch the leg, which we will do, and then we'll come to Steve Corcoran after. But sorry, uh, Senators, but Trevor, thank you so much. Thank you. And you're going to hang around. And I do value the conversations that you and I have, mate. And I know that you're a champion for the industry and your work, mates. But I want to just leave it on this 30 seconds before we go to a quick break. Senator Hanson, I am absolutely buoyed in this nation that we can find a solution. We can sort out the mess that is the road transport industry. And I'll tell you why I say that. Because we have a myriad of decent men and women in this industry that do want to make the changes. A number of them, or all of them are appearing today. And the beauty of this is it's across the industrial divide. We have employers, big, small, medium. We have owner drivers, we have drivers, we have our union, we have our industry representatives. And they fair dink and want to roll the sleeves up and they want to fix up this custard tart that we have which is called the road transporting and i'm bored that this can happen on that let's take a 15 minute break and we'll see you when you come back thanks everyone come and have a cup of tea everyone have we got a cup of tea i like